Uh, first of all, I just want to thank Kate because I came in and it was just calm about the whole tech issue. Uh, not much of a show if you can't show slides for an art talk. Um, so, and then I also would like to thank Kathleen and Ken for just inviting me to give this uh, talk. I want to welcome everyone to this visual tour highlighting the Barnes Foundation. Let me start by saying that one of the most important lessons that I've learned since being at the Barnes is to look at the works directly. Uh, this was so much a part of what Albert Barnes wanted visitors to understand. And during his lifetime, he rarely allowed photographs to be taken of the collection because of this, because of the importance that he placed on seeing the works directly. So I hope after this overview that I give you today that I will have the privilege of perhaps giving you a tour if you come to the Barnes. We are looking at where the Barnes collection was originally on display in Marion. Uh, it's about 20 minute drive from its present location in Philadelphia. Today in the Barnes Foundation, designed by Todd Williams and Billy Tsien, visitors will find the galleries that existed in the original Marion location, uh, and they have been carefully reproduced. And here is an aerial of its current location surrounded by the other important cultural institutions. Uh, and I want to add that the Calder Museum is going to be open next year. That's the intended uh, opening date. And I believe at this point, the Barnes Foundation is going to be the main administrators in terms of coordinating guides and get, uh, ticketing. So that, that's been the latest rumor. Uh, when controversial plans were being discussed for moving the Barnes collection from Marion to its current location, a unique and some would say unusual decision was made to duplicate the original gallery spaces. Today, the recreated gallery spaces from the original Marion building have been incorporated into a 93,000 square foot complex. The new home for the collection is nearly 10 times the size of the original building. Uh, but Albert Barnes' vision for his collection has not changed. Every single work and its placement was thoughtfully and carefully set by Albert Barnes. And each wall became a teaching wall. And these carefully orchestrated collection of drawings, paintings, Metalworks and objects remain and are referred to as ensembles, a word you will hear me say over and over tonight. He was born in a working class family in 1872, an American rags to riches story. His father, a butcher, was a veteran of the American Civil War where he lost his right arm and the family's financial situation was always extremely difficult. After the war, his father received a small disability pension and worked the various jobs that he could find. Born and raised in Philadelphia, Barnes spent most of his youth growing up in the rough and tumble area known as the Neck in South Philly, a very poor, undeveloped, and unsafe area where despite the challenges, Barnes would emerge, learn boxing, leaving a complicated legacy, but one that continues to intrigue. After entering high school, the family was able to move closer to the center of Philadelphia, Tasker Street, a block away from South Broad Street, and about a mile and a half from Philadelphia's City Hall. What I find strange in Philadelphia, because I lived for 30 years in New York, in Philadelphia, it seems like every, every small event that happened in its history, there's a green sign. And surprisingly, this is one house that doesn't have a green, green sign. <clears throat> Barnes's intelligence gained him entrance into Central High School, regarded at the time as a top public high school not just locally, but in the entire United States. In addition, the rigorous and leading edge central high school curriculum allowed exceptional students to graduate with a bachelor's degree when they completed their studies. At the incredible young age of 17, he had a college degree. 
Barnes's successful academic career continued when he gained admissions into the University of Pennsylvania's medical school. He had a strong interest in chemistry. He was very analytical and knew even before graduating that he did not want a career in clinical work. He did not want to touch patients. After completing his residency in a psychiatric hospital, he had passed requirements to be a medical doctor. And even more incredible, at the age of 20, he was an MD. Barnes was interested in chemistry, and this interest led him to Germany, where a prosperous pharmaceutical industry was already in place. This early chapter of Barnes' life has many subplots that I won't get into right now. After returning from Germany, Barnes married Laura Leggett from Park Slope, Brooklyn. Laura developed a love for horticulture, perhaps equal to what her husband had for art. She would eventually become the director of the Arboretum that was part of their gallery complex. Landscape grounds covered 12 acres that she filled with rare and exotic plants and trees, grouping them not unlike her husband's ensembles in the gallery. Despite some very unusual career changes, financial success arrives when he begins a partnership with a German chemist whom he met in Germany, Hermann Heil, a young PhD chemist recruited to work in the U.S. by Barnes. Together, they developed and marketed a pharmaceutical treatment trade name Argerol. Argerol is a silver nitrate antiseptic compound that was effective when applied to the delicate tissues of a newborn infant's eyes for the prevention of gonorrheal infections, an important treatment that came at a time when antibiotics and vaccines did not exist. Barnes gained business and financial success quickly. With respect to the Barnes Foundation, a defining period arrived when he renewed his friendship with William Glackins, a high school classmate and a fellow teammate on the high school baseball team. Even in high school, Glackins was known as the high school artist, and he would become a renowned magazine illustrator. The renewed friendship between Glackins and Barnes played a significant and important part in guiding and igniting further Barnes's appreciation and interest in modern art. And 1912 is a significant year in the history of this collection because it is the year that Albert Barnes gave William Glackins $20,000 and asked him and his expertise to go to Paris and look for works of art. This agreement proved to be a defining moment for the Barnes collection, as well as their continued friendship. Barnes was 49 years old when Glackens headed to Paris, and 16 of those 33 works purchased by Glackens in Paris remain in the collection today. For those who love dogs, one pertains to Albert Barnes's favorite dog, Fidel. Barnes met Fidel in Normandy, France, and this dog came to live with Barnes in the United States when he was in his late 60s. Barnes occasionally used Fidel to sign his official letters, mostly to those he did not like. <laughs> and before we virtually enter the collection, here are some statistical highlights, several of which are particularly surprising. There are over 2,900 works in the collection, 942 paintings, 181 works by the painter Auguste Renoir, 69 by Paul Cezanne, 59 by Henri Matisse, 21 by Heim Soutine, and 18 by Henri Rousseau. In addition, African and American Indian works hold a special place in this collection. So let's virtually begin our tour. Gallery number one immediately highlights what makes this collection unique. 
This opening gallery is relatively small by floor area, but the soaring 33-foot-high faceted barrel-vaulted ceiling was already a powerful statement Barnes was making about the value he saw in the modern art he was collecting. At a time when there was little interest and almost no attention given to these new images coming out of Paris, Barnes was creating this impressive space for his collection. On entering Gallery 1, Barnes is immediately introducing us to the two most important up-and-coming modern artists of his time, Henri Matisse and Pablo Picasso. And when we turn around from the large window wall, we are looking at works by Paul Cezanne and Pierre-Auguste Renoir, two towering vanguards that Barnes was extremely passionate and knowledgeable about. The minute visitors walk into Gallery 1, many are overwhelmed by the density, placement, and the unusual mix of paintings, furniture, metalwork, and unusual collectibles. Some visitors often say to me that the walls looked cramped, making the collection visually overwhelming. But before looking at specific works, I want to highlight and offer an, an explanation to three major aspects that were emphasized by Albert Barnes and how he approached looking at art, ideas that many find refreshing and important. Barnes wanted to empower visitors to experience art and by extension, life. He was not interested in the opinions of art critics, art historians, graduates of art schools from prestigious universities or scholars who were steeped with the detailed information about the history, significance, and providence of a work. For Barnes, everything you needed started by just looking. And for many guides at the Barnes, we often say to each other, just look at the damn thing. <laughs> In his writings, Barnes explained a starting point to looking, referred to as the objective method. It begins by considering works as objects, objects stripped away of all preconceptions, academic and historical references, and instructions about how to look and interpret the work. Barnes identified four key elements as a basic starting point, elements that he believed to be common to all works of art, light, line, color, and space. The importance of looking was paramount in what he promoted, and these four aspects is at the heart of what an artist can control. So let me very briefly give focus to these four elements. Light. How does an artist on a flat surface create a sensation of light? How would you describe the light in these two works by Claude Monet and Albert Le Bourne? What gives these works a diffused light quality? How is light communicated by these artists? How would you describe the light? What emotions are captured with the light they have created? Looking carefully, and finding ways to express various qualities of light can greatly expand how we can experience a visual image. The intensity, the light source, the directional quality, the mood created, the clarity of the light, the colors and its impact on the overall composition. In these examples, the following words may come to mind. Moody, misty, moist, muted, soft, gray. In this example, what qualities of light does the artist create? Light concentrated as seen in the work by the American artist William Glackins, Barnes's high school friend. Compared to the other extreme we just saw, the following words may come to mind. Intense, warm, sharp, deep, summer, rich, brilliant, cheerful. How are figures, forms, spaces being communicated? How are lines being used to describe forms, edges, contours, volume, softness, hardness, 
delicacy, coarseness, can they still be considered lines? Are figures illustrated? Does it feel delicate, abbreviated, crude, harsh, detailed? How does the choice of line type impact how we view the subjects here? Is it illustrative, decorative, fine, coarse, hard, soft, precise, vague? How color is used carries the greatest importance for Barnes. The intensity of blue alone creates an incredible mood and atmosphere. Words that may come to mind, moody, cold, transfusional, deep, appealing, pensive, and look at the impact of these red images. An intense emotional quality immediately radiates fiery, glowing, warm, sensuous, brilliant, atmospheric, glamorous, and finally taking time to evaluate the spaces created. How is the artist creating the space? What kind of space is being suggested? Is it a real space? There are still, um, 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 what gets emphasized when an artist gets close up? Details, structure, is there an intimacy? What is the focus? Does getting closer mean more details? Do the colors become more complex? Where are we looking from? And how does one's, how does our perception of space change with this work by Claude Lorraine? How does he achieve this sense of deep space? What happens with objects close up? Where is the focus in this work? Do colors change from near to far? Do lines change from near to far? And what mood is conveyed with this view he has created? While Barnes emphasized these four basic elements of looking as a starting point, his approach expanded greatly to include much, much more, a wider range of ideas, ideas that included such aspects as distortions, decorative qualities, compositional aspects, painting techniques, and so much more. And as we become more informed and sensitive to looking, developing our filters, Barnes emphasized the traditions, the history of art at large, and the impact artists, craftspeople, artisans, sculptors, and metal workers all had on each other. Barnes said, quote, art appreciation can no more be absorbed by aimless wandering in galleries than surgery can be learned by casual visits to a hospital, unquote. Developing an approach towards looking, finding new words, grappling with our own visual vocabulary, being more attentive to the overall as well as details, and finding ways of describing what we are seeing and building on these experiences is so much a part of what Barnes wanted to instill. The second important aspect of this collection is what we refer to as ensembles. Barnes found interesting aspects and interrelationships in, in everything visual. Paintings, furniture, pottery, candlesticks, locks, knives, pots, and pans. Each painting, each object, each wall, and each gallery went into his thinking about how to arrange his collection in order to highlight and contrast relationships he saw and felt. Finally, new visitors will notice the intriguing and unusual placement and adjacencies of works. The galleries are packed, and unlike most museums, there's an absence of descriptive labels. The galleries are not arranged by historical periods, stylistic movements, by country, by artist, or even by a work's previous ownership. But each wall offers viewers a potentially fascinating visual journey. For example, the timeline on this wall spans over 400 years with a work from 1520 attributed to Giorgione to one by William Glockins from 1915. Hanging next to Matisse's grand mural, 
that we saw earlier is another large and impactful painting. Likewise with eight nudes. Yes. This work is one of three exceptionally large paintings by Paul Cezanne, started at the end of his career. Why he chose to maximize his canvases at the end of his career is puzzling. Cezanne was greatly influenced by the Impressionists, and his paintings changed with the emergence of more vibrant colors, the quest to capture the fleeting changes of light, and his dedicated and unique approach to how he applied his paint. Cezanne had a desire to establish a new tradition and make Impressionism something solid and lasting. Cezanne felt Impressionism was not sufficiently objective. Images lacked rigor. Many works looked flimsy. They looked sloppy and lacked structure and, and clarity. And he questioned one of the most basic premises of image making, how we see and the dogma of one point perspective. These are the three enormous paintings Cezanne was working on late in his life. Two are located here in Philadelphia, and the third one is located at the National Gallery in London. Cezanne approached his works with an intense analytical discipline, and in his late work, his stylistic approach to his brushwork is distinctly Cezanne-esque. There is nothing ephemeral flimsy or feathery in his approach. His figures and the scene have a sculptural quality, and the canvas at large has a unified structural and architectural solidity. Renoir was 55 years old when he painted this family portrait in 1896. This is now 22 years after the first Impressionist show in 1874, and his style had changed. He is financially stable, living in a new home in a coveted neighborhood of the Montmartre section of Paris. Shown in this family portrait are Eline Charagut, his wife, his 11-year-old son Pierre, and two-year-old son Jean. Also included is Gabrielle Renard, a distant cousin of Eline, who joined the family as a governess two years before this painting was completed. The young girl was the daughter of Paul Alexis, a renowned writer who lived in the neighborhood. Renoir portrays his family in a casual way, set in a pastoral space. They are portrayed in an intimate and elegant way. And although not everyone is a direct family member, there is a genuine sense of warmth and closeness. This is a large painting with gentle and softly painted areas. The figures have a fullness enhanced by the fabrics in their attire. There is an impressionistic softness to how the landscape has been painted with lightly applied puffy masses of foliage that emphasize the fullness of the figures. Beautiful complex bonnets. Aileen's blouse is a complex patchwork of exuberant multicolored brushstrokes. Renoir also shows how he is able to handle monochromatic paint areas like the large areas of black, white, red, and blue. And compositionally, there are many bold contrasts and alignments that draw and hold our attention. The soft, feathery, delicate, painterly qualities of Renoir are completely absent in this Paul Cezanne's work, The Card Players. It was painted in X, his hometown on his father's estate. Welcome to this card table setting. Cezanne knew these men who worked on his father's estate all his life, and throughout his career, Cezanne held an admiration for the simplicity and the natural dignity of the working class. There is a monumental quality in how he has depicted this simple scene, the distinctive manner in which the colors have been applied. The patches of color laid down in distinctive paint dabs, applied carefully and like a construction site, carefully placing and building the forms in composition. This is a quality that is uniquely Cezanne-esque. 
The composition also has a look of a landscape, a quality that emphasizes and enhances this feeling of solidity and plantedness in the scene, qualities that typify so many of his paintings. Picasso's The Peasant is another large and monumental work in the history of modern art that hangs in Gallery One. There are so many stories related to this early stage of Picasso's career. Some of you may be familiar with a dark and sad period that Picasso went through a few years before this was painted, a sadness triggered by the death of his Spanish friend, Carlos Casajemos, who accompanied Picasso on his first trip to Paris. In this painting, completed roughly five years after his friend's passing, Picasso has returned to Spain with much needed money earned from his first big break with selling his paintings. He returned to Gozo, a small Catalan village in southern Spain, proudly accompanied by his French girlfriend, Fernand Olivier. His time in Gozo has been characterized as a joyful time, even though the trip ended frantically because Picasso feared catching a disease that had broken out in the village. Sketches for this painting of a man and girl carrying flowers were completed in Spain. During his time in the village, Picasso had become intrigued with newly discovered ancient Spanish sculpture, and his style would be influenced and take on a different look. His new works took a sharp turn from the melancholic, vulnerable, anemic circus figures to figures that became more solid, robust, and flavored with an antique Iberian sculptural qualities. But there's even more going on. Distortions, figures have been attenuated, stretched, and his color palette shifted to a more earthy and grounded hues. And many would say there are Cubist qualities, perhaps more clearly seen in the influence of the great 16th century fellow Spanish painter El Greco. This work by El Greco portrays the Polish Dominican priest Hyacinth, born in the 10th century and granted sainthood for his work to reform the conditions for women in Polish monasteries. El Greco's style is characterized by his use of unique and rich colors, a freer and sketchy painting style, and the distortions he made, the elongation and the exaggeration he uses to portray his subjects. And with Picasso's work, we see how he likewise exaggerates and uses distortion. The young girl's tiny midsection, the man's small head in Picasso's work, they are solid and robust, and along with the oxen, they are all virtually competing to occupy the same narrow space. He treats the fabric like it's carved in stone with faceted flickers of light and dark across the surface. By 1906, rejuvenated by his time in Gozo, Spain, Picasso, his newly appreciated uh, appreciation for Arberian artifacts, his expanding acquaintances of non-Spaniards in Paris, and the financial security Picasso had gained with selling of his art, life appeared to be moving more clearly towards artistic success. But surprisingly, he almost immediately changed directions once he returned to Paris in what he had been producing. For over eight months, his life would become consumed with preparing preliminary sketches for a new work, filling 16 sketchbooks where he struggled to create a new pictorial language. Le Demoiselles de Avignon marks an extreme radical break, a break from Impressionism, Pointillism, and traditional painting compositions and perspective. It depicts five naked women prostitutes. The figures are constructed with flat, splintered planes, and the inspiration for the faces are rooted in Iberian sculpture and African mass. The space the figures occupy is confusingly both two- and three-dimensional, spatially compressed, and the figures project forward in jagged and unusually shaped shards. 
planes overlap, but what is in front and what is in back is unclear and made all the more confusing by where the shading has been provided. And for a painting with five prostitutes, it is decidedly not sexy with the figural distortions and the grotesque faces. The gay and prosperous impressions of Paris in the early 1900s was not the glamorous city often depicted in history, and some artists created their own visual worlds. Paintings that took viewers away from the growing pains of industrialization, the, the crowded conditions, and the degrading conditions of their environment. Henri Rousseau was 60 years old when he painted this work scouts attacked by a tiger. And surprisingly, this self-taught artist, ridiculed by others, attracted a fan base, drawing his first large audiences after exhibiting at the Salon des Refusés in 1884. The Salon des Refusés was an exhibition offered to those artists whose paintings and art were not accepted to the coveted and most prestigious national salon show. Despite the lesser reputation of the Salon des Refusés, Rousseau's fans grew and were fascinated by his exotic and ambitious compositions set in storied spaces that included incredible details, vines, rainforest vegetations, tigers, lions, and bears. This was a fantasy an interior world, an imaginative world different from the grim cities that industrialization was creating. Rousseau was a man with very humble roots. After five years in the military, he enters government service, collecting taxes. At 41, he begins painting, and by 49, he decides to give up his job to paint full time. Although ridiculed by many, this self-taught painter had, had imagination, loved details, and mastered a style that many found enchanting. Another artist that likewise attracted viewers who dreamed of a more pristine, unspoiled world was Paul Gauguin. This, wor this work, She Goes to the Freshwater, was painted 1892 in the Tahitis, a French colonized domain Regrettably, the intervention of the French had already spoiled the pristine landscape of the Tahitis. But despite this reality, Gauguin would take images that continue to mesmerize us today. In this scene, a young woman is seen drying herself after a bath by a stream. Gauguin moved to Tahiti marks the last major move he would make in his life. A life, that many, a life that saw many career and style changes. The images created from this chapter of his life are perhaps the most poignant. Here is an imaginary world, a woman in harmony with her natural surroundings, and he is creating these moody island scenes by introducing his unique colors and styles. But let's return Barnes' keen interest with ensembles. Here is one interpretation about this arrangement of paintings and objects, where Gauguin's painting anchors and hangs at its center. As I had indicated earlier, Barnes found beauty and interrelationships in everything visual. And here are some observations about this ensemble. So I want to highlight some of the more obvious relationships in this particular wall. Look at the arrangement of the paintings, metalwork, and objects. With every wall, you will notice different patterns, arrangements, and a particular geometrical <coughs> emphasis. On this wall, there's a clear <coughs> triangular arrangement. Notice the two large Renoir nudes at the far right and left. Let's just pretend that if these two women are looking to move, if they get tired of sitting in their corners, these two women, these two robust figures can slide into the well-positioned and beautifully colored and wide Windsor chairs below. Their soft backsides <laughs> will be well accommodated uh, form follows function. 
notice the door hinges and how they are figuratively shaped, dress-like or buttocks-like, you decide. Notice the silvery pewter tea kettle and its distinctive pouring spout and how its shape relates to the twisted tree branch suspended over the stream in Gauguin's painting. And finally, notice the rippling water in Gauguin's painting and the rippling swirls echoed in the American Pennsylvania German chest. And finally, notice the large elaborate iron key at the apex of the pyramid. This metalwork served as a sign for a key store. Do you see how its overall form and construction resonates with the <coughs> composition and shapes of Gauguin's painting? Kaim Soutine was born in a chateau, a small Jewish village sometime around 1893 in the town of Smilovici, Belarus. As often told, an often told story about Soutine's drive to make art occurred when he was a young boy. He made a portrait sketch of the rabbi. However, in an orthodox religious community where the depiction of human figures was equated with heresy and blasphemy, a grave violation of the second commandment, he suffered a furious beating from the devout son and a friend for the depiction. His mother took the lead in defending her son. And one story told is that by way of the local court, and the rabbi agreed to compensate the family financially. Another story told is the rabbi feared Soutine's parents would go to the police and gave the father hush money and advised him to send Kaim away to study art. The small amount paid was enough to allow Soutine to escape, and the allure of Paris drew him as well. Kaim Soutine, at the age of 20, Journey from Belarus to Paris, where Albert Barnes is credited with shining a spotlight on his work. This painting, The Pastry Chef, is a work by Barnes that, that Barnes saw in 1923 during one of his early trips to Paris. He was so impressed and taken by the colors and the uniqueness of this work that he asked to see more, and he would return to the U.S. with over 50 works. And for the first time in Soutine's life, his financial concerns were eliminated, and the price for his works rose considerably after this recognition. The photo of the young man is Remy Zucchetto, the Italian chef depicted in the painting. A story is told that he was offered either the painting or a fee for modeling. He chose the cash, thinking Soutine's painting did not look good. The other photo is Remy again years later in 1970. Manet, Manet was one of the most important voices of his time, and he is known for changing the subject matter of paintings and capturing the provocative scenes of modern life in Paris, cafes, theaters, and parks. But he was also well acquainted with sea life, where he spent six months as a young man on a training ship from France to South America. In his early 40s, Manet painted this scene, tarring the boat, in the quiet fishing village of Berk-sur-Mer, where two men are seeing water sealing the underside of a boat by tarring. Manet strived towards giving his paintings a sense of immediacy, even though very often he worked many long hours. In this quickly rendered image, Manet uses a variety of coarse, quick brushstrokes where details are completely lacking. We can almost feel the sea breeze carrying the flaming tar smoke across the boat. We sense the hot blaze of the fire glowing pink, red, and yellow. And we see the turbulent, active sea beyond, created with a few dry, horizontal brush strokes. And Manet's energetic movement of the brush and the way he quickly caught the essence of the scene with a few brief brushstrokes had an impact on painters who followed. 
A painter who was eight years younger than Manet was Claude Monet, considered the quintessential impressionist painter. He was among a group that explored many new ideas about image making, but of greatest impact was their desire to capture the feeling, the fleeting changes of color and light, embracing modernity and incorporating innovative techniques and materials. The name of this painting is the Studio Boat. For almost eight years, Monet lived near the Seine River, 15 minutes by train from Paris. He had a small boat made for himself and how he must have loved his painting trips on the river. This is a self-portrait of sorts, painted in 1876, two years after the first impression is shown. Monet's focus on color, light, painting outside, plein air, and embracing a new visual vocabulary are on full display here. And of special importance in this work is the figure inside the boat, silhouetted in a bright square is Monet. Compositionally, we are drawn to the central figure. What better way to contrast the new, untraditional painting techniques of the Impressionists than to look at our next highlight? Jean Chardin was 33 years old when he started this painting. It was completed eight years later. During this period of his life, he was going through many ups and downs. A son was born, but only four years later, both his wife and daughter passed away. Chardin was modest, painted very slowly, and was highly regarded during his lifetime. He was an innovator whose handling of light and shadow inspired generations that followed. His position in society would also rise prominently during his life, where he eventually oversaw the painting installations at the annual Grand French Salons. His handling of paint, how he created light and shade, his colors, his supreme attention to minute details, the luminous light he achieved are hallmarks of Chardin's reputation. A Barnes instructor I had for several courses had a special fondness for this painting and jokingly said one day, if an emergency exit was ever needed, he would rush to say this particular painting and I have joined his fan club. Notice the beautiful light and shadows, the colors, or as Barnes would describe, structural colors, colors that alone build the build the object's forms. This composition is completely coordinated, where relationships abound. Every brushstroke was intentional, and there is a luminosity in the colors, rhythm, tensions, and the objects have a plantedness. Even if we consider these objects from above or in a top view, we can see the incredible planning that went into this composition. Barnes was interested in absorbed with colors and Matisse perhaps best highlights the celebration of exuberant and unique colors. This is a portrait of Matisse's wife, Amelie, and this image represents yet another turning point in his early career. He was moving away from the spontaneous, loosely brushed intensity, vivid color style that would become known as the fog style towards a flatter, compartmentalized colors and a more decorative approach. Many viewers who see this painting for the first time are moved by its colors and bold, simplified, simplified rendering of Amelie. It feels flat and the decorative patterns activate the surface. There's no modeling in the traditional sense, but there is modeling using bold and unique colors. The composition is filled with rhythmic curves and made even more lively by how Amelie pivots around her chair. So much is missed when looking at a painting like this on screen. What I love about this painting that cannot be seen on the screen is the texture and the feel of the colors. In person, the colors seem even more intense, brilliant, dramatic, by its enamel-like surface. 
An interesting contrast to Matisse's portrait is looking at how Vincent van Gogh handled his portrait of Joseph Rouland. Van Gogh's life story adds poignancy to this portrait because this relationship especially was one he loved and respected. Six different versions of Joseph were painted. Joseph was the mail handler at the train station in Arles and became a close and loyal friend. For Vincent, he was the personification of the good-natured, well-intentioned people of Provence. I think the colors, boldness, energetically charged brushstrokes of Van Gogh's paintings resonates quickly for most viewers. This is a work that is best viewed live, where you can savor not only the colors, boldness of brushstrokes, the decorative quality of the background, but capture the extraordinary emotions of the portrait and the textures on the surface. As we have been looking at portraits by Matisse and Van Gogh, I want to include one more standout in the collection, Amadeo Medigliani. He was another non-French citizen from Italy who was drawn to Paris in the early 1900s. His life story alone is compelling. A Sephardic Jew, Medigliani from his earliest years was sickly, battling pleurisy and the effects of typhoid. He suffered further in his teens with tuberculosis. He really wanted to be a sculptor, but physically he could not sustain the physical effort needed to continue, and he is best known for his paintings. However, this work, Girl with a Polka Dot Blouse, painted in 1919, clearly demonstrates how closely Medigliani's painted portraits rely on the stone heads he had carved. Many of his works are characterized by a rigorous frontality, elongated proportions, the influence of African masks, and both an androgynous and Egyptian quality. Modigliani had that special ability to create portraits that were both generalized in his special style and specific to his sitters. Modigliani, as well as others, began taking notice of African art in the early 1900s. <coughs> Artists were exploring new ways of expression. Barnes saw African works at the pure, as the purest expression of three-dimensional form and ranked African works among the world's great traditions. He also saw these works as an important form of black cultural expression and felt they could be explored and used as tools for the advancement of racial equality. He was among the first art collectors who took an interest and developed a deep appreciation for the elements and the harmonious plastic qualities of these African pieces. In 1923, Barnes had already amassed over 100 African works and is quoted as having said, I intend to make Negro art a big feature of this foundation. And as soon as that happens, all the American museums will probably want to obtain good examples too. Um, this work is captivating. Seated couple depe depicting a Dogen couple from West Africa. Dogen works are from an area that is currently known as the country of Mali. This man and woman was likely a work used during funeral processions, where this object would be attractive to spirits that would mediate between the world of the living and the dead. Barnes considered this a masterpiece and compared it to a Gothic cathedral, an ideal vision of symmetry and balance uh, in how the roles of a man and woman were depicted. It has an architectural symmetry and solidity. The figures are intricately connected, beautifully attenuated, and highlighting the balance of their roles in life. This painting is a watershed moment in the history of 20th century modern art. Matisse's Joy of Life, painted 1905 to 06, when he was in his mid-30s, this is his foulest masterpiece, a style marked by vivid colors. 
free treated of uh, freely treated of forms and emphasize a vibrant decorative quality. And its recognition came late because Barnes rarely allowed his collection to be photographed, especially color photographs. Even today, viewers find this painting surprising, confounding, a little bit unusual, and still capable of stretching our idea about image making. Once again, a central point with this work is color, still unusual and riveting today. Matisse is using colors in a brand new way, and I can't imagine what the colors would have been like when it was first painted, because they have clearly faded since it was first introduced. Gallery one has a barrel vaulted ceiling rising 33 feet, and it is made more complex with three lunettes above the grand windows that intersects the vaulted ceiling. It was a space where the intensity of a northwestern light coming through the large windows changed significantly throughout the day, and the narrow width of the room would require some craning of the neck to view the spaces above the windows, the lunettes, they are called. In 1930, during a visit to the U.S. and after visiting Barnes, Matisse received an official letter of agreement to paint a mural, a commission from Barnes to fill the lunettes in the main gallery. The U.S. stock market had just crashed a year earlier, and although Matisse's reputation was at its height, money was limited, and his creative well had diminished as well. But the, at the age of 61, he rented a large vacant garage to begin the largest size project of his career. One year to complete was the time arrangement but it would take three intense years to complete. In these early sketches, he had leaping figures plunging and thrusting from right to left. Heads, arms, and legs disappeared off the edges. But Matisse felt this approach was too aggressive. A large concern was the approach lacked the architectonic qualities he was, want, he was looking for. And after many sketches and approaches, Matisse's mural was finally nearing completion, January 1932. Along the way, he would be inspired by a trip he made to Italy, where seeing the great frescoes of Giotto uh, in Padua would have an impact. He would make plans to have the mural ready for a spring showing. But to a shocking surprise, Matisse realized he had the wrong dimensions for the width of the pendentives. Realizing the error he had, he had made with the dimensions, Matisse put aside the second version and started over. Once again, Matisse struggled to make changes to the composition in order to unify the panels across the broader architectural pendentives. But finally, after three arduous years of work, Matisse would weave and enlarge figures, interpenetrating the lunettes and pendentives. The forms fill the upper portions of the lunettes with greater figural complexity, which from the ground level adds to the mural's monumental effect. 